I decided to talk about uh, tuberculosis, uh, which is, uh, in my opinion, caused by one of the most intelligent pathogen known to humanity. So my talk will be structured around two themes. One is I'll introduce tuberculosis to this audience, other than a microbiologist and few other people who have heard about the bacillus. I believe there is no group of working on TB in ICGB here, but ICGB New Delhi, there's a strong group. Uh, Kanuri Rao has been working a lot on the, in this. And I'll also then give you some evidence why I believe it's a super intelligent pathogen. And then I'll uh, conclude by where do we stand if we have to eradicate tuberculosis and do we at all succeed or it will continue to be a challenge. If you can see from this slide, wherever there is human habitation except for places like this and I do not understand why this part of Africa there are no evidence or no in reports of TB. But otherwise, everywhere in the world, you will see tuberculosis being quite rampant. And mostly in this part of, uh, of, uh, of the world where it, it's perhaps the highest incidence. But almost everywhere you find tuberculosis. The problem with TB is that if you just looked about a few years ago, only half a million new cases of MDR TB. MDR stands for multiple drug resistant TB, which means it is not the ordinary TB which can be cured and treated by antibiotics, but you need to look at second line of antibiotics and I'll talk to you what are those lines. And the, in the worst part is 6% of the new TB cases, but 20% of previously treated TB cases and that's where we need to have some programmatic decisions about at least countries such as India and in the East where TB medicines are available over the counter and drug abuse is quite common. Drug means antibiotic abuse is quite common. And all of us, in fact, at least in India, almost everybody would have been exposed to the bacilli. And by abusing the antibiotics, we are making them, sensitizing them to antibiotics. And that could be the reason why we have a staggering 20% of previously treated TB cases. It's also got to do with the fact that these people who were earlier treated they did not go for the full treatment because you need six months minimum treatment regime and you start feeling normal, feeling healthy and you feel that I'm absolutely cured whereas the bacilli is simply hiding and trying to regroup itself and rearm itself and discovering that my weaknesses are these antibiotics so let me mutate those target sites and that's why you get such a high. MDR is followed by extensively drug resistant and today we are also looking at, if <coughs> this is the scenario that you see uh, a percentage of previously treated TB cases, mostly where you have drug abuse problems and TB cases with, with multi-drug resistant TB. We also have what is known as TB of organs other than lungs. TB is pre predominantly pulmonary, it affects the lungs, but there are recent uh, report done by one of my collaborator, a clinical a clinician very active clinician scientist who has looked at it in at least in the Indian sitting settings uh, and 25% of the TB as of today is in India and in this scenario about 15 to 20% of extra pulmonary TB in HIV uninfected individuals that's a big number 15 to 20% of TB cases are those which are not affecting the lungs but other tissues it could be heart it could be muscles it could be liver, it could be brain, it could be blood, it could be any, it could be genital TB, it could be any other part of the TB. And if you look at the t cases where you have HIV infected individuals, the number could be as high as 70 percent. And that is the, the alarming part. If you have HIV or other co-infection, you have problems because then the problems of TB iris, immune refractile inflammatory syndrome, which do you want to treat first, the TB or the HIV? And what happens if you treat HIV first and TB second? I mean, these are real clinical problems for a clinician. And if you have extra pulmonary TB, there is no rapid diagnosis. At least with pulmonary TB, you can do a quick X-ray of the chest and, and take a decision. With extra pulmonary TB, it's very difficult to diagnose and a prolonged and extended treatment. Synergy, synergy with other infections or immune suppressed conditions, the TB, HIV, diabetes synergy, which is a triple trouble. 
and again once again India is, is having the dubious distinction of emerging likely to emerge as a diabetes capital of the world in about 10 years time and that is where you will have problems of treating because the first line of TB drugs are contraindicated when you have diabetes. Diagnosis continues to be a challenge early detection, detection and immune compromised population, latent TB. If I can control and latent TB and let it stay as latent, it is absolutely fine. There is no pathology for the patient, for the, for the individual, he will be absolutely normal. But how do I know that he has a latent TB and when can he be activated into an active TB? It is a big question mark. As I mentioned, extra pulmonary TB and childhood tuberculosis. And that is where we have made some contribution in the past and very recently some contribution that has come up which is now uh, we are exploiting it and doing clinical validation of that. As I said MDR-TB standard six to nine months treatment with these four drugs and no effective drug for TB after rifampicin that was discovered for the first, this was the last drug back in 63. So you can imagine 50 years have passed and there is no new drug against tuberculosis except for two new drugs which have just been fast tracked by the WHO given the fact that we are looking at extra looking at uh, drug resistant TB which is a second line drugs which again are four to six drugs two years one has to take treatment is based on laboratory drug resistant testing and epi, epi information very high toxicity and expensive and the cure rate is less than 80 percent and the worst scenario is totally drug resistant TB where the person is resistant to all drugs. It is with this background that the WHO fast track two drugs, Delamanid and the other one, Bedaquiloin. You can make out these are only in the, this was in the early stage of clinical development, phase two just being tested for efficacy. And the WHO decided to fast track it. Phase three not completed, but they decided to fast track it because there is no new candidate, there is no new drug. How do we treat people who failed XDR or who are totally drug resistant tuberculosis? That is the reason why these two drugs are fast tracked. What is the scenario with the vaccine? There are quite a few vaccines against TB which are in the, in the developmental stages funded by different agencies including the Wellcome Trust, the Bill Gates Foundation and many other bodies. But none of them have reached a stage where we can say they are effective vaccine. There is growing focus now to look at vaccines, not against the pathogen, but host directed, looking at something including interventions against using the host pathways to intervene against tuberculosis. My group has also started looking at, into that. There is a bacterium that has just been, uh, been in, the, in, the, in the limelight about 15, 20 years ago. It was known as Mycobacterium W. Do not confuse with the W strain, the Beijing strain. It was a strain developed by Pran Talwar who was then working at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and it was a random discovery. It, he named it ABCD and the W strain turned out to have a lot of similarities. It is uh, between, uh, between, uh, be, between the M leprae and M tuberculosis and based on these immunological similarities, Talwar started a trial of using this W strain against M leprae. The trials have been very successful. Today leprosy has been almost eradicated and thanks to this MW being put in the market as an as a intervention against leprosy. It is an immunomodulator. It's a, in the trial while it was going on it turned out to be those people who were given placebo as just MW alone to find out if MW itself has any problems or not. And compared with those who were given plain simple distilled water, it turned out to be those who were given the placebo as MW, they were refractile to TB over a 10 year period when the trial were, was decoded. And that was the first indication that this could be useful also against TB. We decided to sequence this W completely and remove the name W and decided to name it as Mycobacterium indicus because it was discovered in India, Pran because Pran Talwar discovered it and NII that is where much of the work was done when I was working at the National Institute of Immunology. So MW is no longer known as MW but scientific literature it is known as MIP Mycobacterium indicus pranai. Indicus pranai is a bacterium if you look at the evolutionary stage 
it's a, one of the predecessor for the modern W strain Beijing, which is the most virulent form of the TB bacterium. It is very early in the, in the, in the evolutionary time scale. It was also considered by one group of people that maybe MD, MIP and IVM paratuberculosis are identical. We have subsequently shown very recently that MIP and MD intracellular are very different from any parameter you look at in terms of the Keck pathway, chemotaxonomic features, biochemical features or growth pattern, MIP is dif distinctly different from M intracellular. And when you compare MIP with the other vaccine strain that has been used as a vaccine, tried as a vaccine against TB, which has the trial has failed, it did not give any protection. And when we compare between M MIP M. Vacchi and H37, the mycobacterium tuberculosis, it turns out to be there's a lot of antigen sharing between MIP and mycobacterium as compared to M. Vacchi and, uh, and, uh, anti and uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. The trials have been completed, results are being decoded. Hopefully, we'll get to know what, what is the result of MIP as a vaccine against mycobacterium tuberculosis which causes TB. Now let me change gears slightly and talk about why TB is a challenge. Why mycobacterium tuberculosis, is con which I consider is an extraordinarily intelligent bacterium with very intelligent survival strategies. All of us are familiar with the central dogma of molecular biology, DNA makes, RNA makes protein. This bacterium also knows the central dogma and it has started looking at how it can thwart the central dogma, how it can act at the level of central dogma. And what it does, okay, okay, this is just a quick life cycle of bacterium. It is airborne, infection is typically airborne. It is not through liquid uh, fluid transmission. And the chances are that you will, you will have a latent infection, in which case you don't need to worry at all unless the latency is activated. This is a black box. We do not know what makes the latency to be uh, affected to be activated and if, if you want to prevent M tuberculosis infection the only way to prevent is to prevent two people to be together which is almost impossible and in high density slum dwellings people have to live together so if I have one person living in, a, in, my, in the dwelling which is active TB it's 100 percent guaranteed that I'll transmit the bacterium to other person and depending on his nutritional, emotional, immunological and infection status he or she may be down with TB or he may have a latent form of TB. So that's how it can spread. If active TB is not treated, it will lead to death. If it is treated, it is absolutely, he is, he'll be absolutely cured. And, and, but nonetheless, if it is not during this period from treatment to cure, he is also acting as a reservoir, as a, as a vector to, to transmit the disease. Clearly, there is a lot of host factors, a lot of host factors that modulate the, the latency that modulate the activation and that modulate how effectively your treatment would be. We and others have been working on it. I was mentioning that the bacterium is very smart. It knows the very basics of the central dogma, how to from DNA. So it knows that the bacterium, this is the, fortunately for the mycobacterium DNA, the single origin of, of replication site. So it knows that if it has to stay in a latent form, it must prevent DNA replication. And to prevent DNA replication, it codes for a protein which is known as in inhibitor of chromosomal initiation, ICIA protein. This protein actually binds to the, binds to the, to the, to the uh, initiator. And because of binding, there is no helix opening. It stays in a latent form. The protein is unbound, which means for latency, there must be a basal minimal expression of ICIA protein. We are now looking at, can we use this protein as a marker for latency? Expression as a marker for latency. Disappearance as a marker for activation. So it has to be a quantitative marker. Quantitative levels have to be estimated. And that's exactly what we are now trying to do. Much of this work has already been published, uh, these two papers plus another couple of papers which have already appeared. So DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, protein. DNA makes DNA, DNA makes RNA. We have some evidence about how it can block even transcription. I'm not talking about it right now in today's presentation. But another protein that was discovered by us very recently is known as the datin protein, 
dormancy associated translation inhibitor. This was a protein that initially from simple uh, modeling studies was shown to be uh, binding to ribosomes and that led us to think that maybe it has to do with the ribosome and subsequently again in a series of papers we showed that it actually inhibits inhibits uh, uh, replication and it functions via a TLR2 mechanism in, 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 in modulating the immune response. Secretion of this of proteins in microbacterium it is not a simple one, one kind of secretion mechanism. Why? Because it knows if it is a simple secretion mechanism it could be more amenable to checks to inhibition. So it has multiple secretion mechanism the type for type 7 secretion system, the SEC2 sec secretion system and the TAT secretion system. TAT is something very recently it has been observed. Iron is a very important constituent um, cofactor for almost all bi biological processes. Mycobacteria does not make its own iron. It steals iron from the host. To steal iron from the host it makes use of the it does not use the host iron quenching machinery it try because if it does then the host will get to know that somebody is using my iron transporter who is this and then immediately it will be alerted that okay this is a mycobacterium that is trying to do it. So what it says I will not use your transporter I will use my own transporter and this is something that one of my student uh, discovered it has a novel exporter importer system which makes use of the two proteins which is uh, uh, which are together RB2895C and IRTA these two together are involved in, in, in sequestering iron acting as a siderophore. Once it is sequestered it is brought inside and iron is then made available and then the siderophore goes back. So this is process is going on and one fine morning the host realizes that its iron is getting lost without its transport being used and because the transport machinery of the host is totally untouched by that time the bacterium is already using and, 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 and being able to cheat the host in, in terms of using the limited amount of iron available for the host function. So iron is a, is a iron chelation and iron act based activation is a key mechanism the bacterium has. Another very interesting observation that we have recently made this is a based on work done by somebody else but we have now found it uh, uh, that intrinsically disordered proteins those of us with a structural uh, biology background will understand. IDPs are nothing but regions of the protein which on their own do not adopt a structure. Why so? Given an opportunity they can adopt whatever structure or requirement is, is there for the particular function. So they can actually mimic and if you look at the archaeans 2 percent bacteria 4.2 percent eukaryotes and that is understandable because eukaryote genome is not as high as one would expect for the kind of function that we have. So the eukaryotes have a very large um, amount of density of IDPs in their, in, their, in their proteins. But this little mycobacterium which is just about 3.2 MB as opposed to human genome it also has almost half of the, of the IDPs and what do these IDPs where are these IDPs present? These are present in a class of protein which are known as the P, PP, PG iris protein. When the genome sequence was first sequenced by Stuart Cole back in 1998 he reported the presence of a family of proteins known as P, PPG, RS proteins. The P stands for proline, glutamic acid, proline, proline, glutamic acid, PG, RS family. This is a family of protein which takes almost 10 percent of the coding capacity is dedicated to this family of protein. Till today this family of protein is not present anywhere in the living kingdom. It is present only in mycobacterium. You won't find this in bacteria, in viruses, in plants, in mycoplasma, anywhere. It is only exclusively in mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mycobacterium tuberculosis unlike bacteria such as helicobacter which evolve by lateral genome acquisition, it evolves by vertical genome reduction which means as I showed you in one of my earlier slides. M MIP is very early much bigger genome almost twice the size of mycobacterium tuberculosis and the most evolved one is mycobacterium lepre which is less than half the size of MIP and mycobacterium tuberculosis which is pretty close to the size of M lepre. 
so there is a vertical genome reduction the only exception is this family of protein which has expanded during evolution at the cost of other genes which have actually been shedded by the bacterium and we have been able to show that most of the proteins in this family are cooperonic and they are present together transcribed together translated together in some cases or in some cases there are two different AUGs to begin the translation and we and others have been able to understand and show why this flexibility is not there why are they together because they need to work together these two protein partners need to work together for a defined function and when I say immune system health it does exactly what I we call it as immune quorum sensing when you grow bacteria E. coli in the in the laboratory in the cell culture initially there is a lag period then there is a log period then stationary period then decays no more growth why is it so it is because the bacterial releases molecules which senses the presence of, of, uh, of growth factors and, and uh, nutrients in the media if, the me if these growth factors become limiting it goes and tells the bacterium through these sensors that there is not enough growth medium enough uh, nutrients you slow down your growth that is where you see a stationary phase and finally it says there is no possibility of growth maintain or there is a decay because the cells are dying to generate the media for the residual bacterium to grow almost identical thing happens with this family of protein PP41 and PP24 and 41 complex it is released to sense how strong is a B cell and how strong is a T cell immune system of the body of the host if the system is very strong immune system is very strong it conveys through a signaling mechanism to look stay where you are stay dormant or do not try to be smart but if the system is weak it goes back and then through a apoptotic pathway which has already been described in detail in this uh, paper uh, that it then says this is the best time immune system is very weak best time for me to activate an immune system could be weak because of uh, uh, nutritional pressures uh, stress it could be because of co-infection stress it could be any kind of stress and that is where what it does again a very smart move it tries to disseminate not by necrotic not by apoptosis because apoptosis will imply that the, the bacteria is safely ap in, in apoptotic bodies and taken care of by the cell so it prefers to induce necrotic pathway for very rapid dissemination and this in silico comparison was being done to ask can we understand the basis for latency basis for dormancy basis for activation basis for pathogenicity so we compared the in silico comparative proteomic analysis of a virulent strain RV from where we it was derived the a virulent strain by serial passage and this was compared compared with genes which were already known to have some role to play and we simply wanted to ask what is the status of these genes in terms of the protein function in terms of the nucleotide changes that have occurred between same gene in the virulent form vis-a-vis -vis in the avirulent form and it turned out to be the PEPP family seemed to have the maximum number of changes and these changes could be hydrophobicity change instability change or phosphorylation sites or globular domains and many of these changes when you go, go back to the literature it turned out to be that they are they are they are they have a role in virulence and that was the first indication that led us to believe that these simple nucleotide changes have allowed a strain to become virulent as opposed to what it was otherwise um, to become avirulent from virulent to avirulent this was between just two strains of H30 mycobacterium tuberculosis what we also find increasing evidence of moonlighting moonlighting simply means a protein X will not have function X it will also have function Y function Z function A function B could be any function four examples the three examples I will give you aconitase is an example which is which is a, a TCA cycle enzyme it is clearly a little complicated slide it is it is it, uh, it is a aconitase uh, uh, as a function of characterization it is also up regulated during drug resistance development it is also a DNA binding protein much of the work has already been published but recently we, uh, we wrote a commentary where we are saying that uh, where we had, uh, looked at uh, of, of the ofloxacin resistant strain and ofloxacin resistant means you are looking at grade 2 drug resistant MDR not uh, 
not uh, simple ones. So uh, XDR, so XDR, and that is where we are now looking at aconitase as a as a because of this moonlighting function. Can we use this to score straight away from serum? Are we, and this is a secretory protein. Uh, whether we are looking at a, a, a drug resistance form, moonlighting isocitrate dehydrogenase. We published this long ago in PNAs uh, about five ten years ago, five six years ago, and we also showed that while it is a, it is a uh, again isocitrate dehydrogenase is an, is an enzyme, it can distinguish vaccinated controls from TB patient, and it has a wide range of activity. So the same protein has immune function, modulates immune response at the same time has a metabolic function not only metabolic fu function but immune function but but it is able to distinguish from vaccinated bcg vaccinated and many of us in india almost all of us in india are given during our childhood a bcg vaccine which prevents in childhood doesn't work in ad adult but nonetheless when i go to to america the first thing they do is to ch check do a man2 test on me and they find i'm man2 positive they say, oh, you are having TB, we would like to treat you to TB for at least three months. Do not work in the lab. It may not be TB at all. It could simply be a residual BCG effect. This protein can make that distinction. It is again patent protected. There is a company which is now trying to look into developing this as a system. Coming back to the SS protein, I did not present all the data. I just showed the data about protects DNA digestion. It protects from radical uh, free, uh, hydroxy radical damage. It also induces, I gave you some flavor of induces maturation of dendritic cells and most importantly it induces IgG response in TB patients of different kinds. And what we have also shown which is again IPR protection file is that it is a potential subunit vaccine candidate and a DNA and protein based diagnostic. This is something we have now started a large scale validation. We already have got samples more than 200 samples of different classes, clinical samples have been have been uh, gathered now. We are working with our clinicians and trying to use this protein, SS1 protein, as a diagnostic. So, look at this protein. It is a signature protein present exclusively in MTB complex, does not is not present anywhere else, and it has multiple function. It is also a protein that is, if you knock it out, the, the bacteria does not survive. So, which means it could be a drug target. So, th this is something that we have just found. Another very smart strategy that the bacterium use is what is known as uh, human mesenchymal stem cells getting into there. Human mesenchymal stem cells as we all know it regulates the T-Rex and blocks CD4, B cell, CD8. It also blocks disease activities and in the process if I am a macrobacteria and I stay in here chances are that I will be completely knocking off antigen presentation. I will have large amount of IL-10 producing macrophages which will give a predominant pathogen response and MTB will proliferate. To conclude the last few slides, the grand challenge for TB control and elimination the target was by 2015 we will reduce the global TB incidence per capita prevalence and death rate by 50 percent compared to 1990 levels. And in fact we have now reduced to 35 percent decline. So we are approaching but not 50 percent. The target is again by 2050 will completely eliminate TB by saying eliminate TB it would be incidence of active TB less than one case per million population. Now this is an ambitious target and for this to achieve we need to do a lot of things. We need to harmonize research efforts globally to build a continuum across fields and among all investigators maximizing knowledge sharing and promoting consensus and most importantly political commitment. I must say thanks to some of the work that we did earlier the government of India decided to ban ELISA based testing of tuberculosis. Why? Because we were the first to show very categorically that the antigens used in ELISA testing have lot of differences are so very different in the Indian isolate circulating there. So what will work in the US in the US and the Europe will not work in India and we showed evidence for that. And after sustained advocacy, the government of India decided to ban the use of such antigen based test. We again were first to show that MDR can be detected by rifampicin. And again, thanks to that, India was the first to start using recommending rifampicin as a, as a, as a marker for MDR. We were also the first to show that 
not the first issue, to highlight the importance of TB as a grave health hazard, grave medical emergency. And today TB has become a, a notifiable disease by the government of India. Anybody, any case of TB, it must be notified and public health authorities have to intervene immediately and the patient has to be put in on, on, uh, on uh, what is known as RNTCB, Rashtriya National TB Control Program. But unfortunately, given the poor resources allocation to TB and health issues, only 40% of the TB cases go to the national program. Remaining 60% still go to the non-national programs, go to the private hospitals, go to clinics, where they still use ELISA-based kits. They still do empirical treatment without verifying TB. And that's where we need a political commitment to really work together with the government. So TB can be eliminated because we know the cause, we know the how it is transmitted, we know how to treat, and we know how to prevent. But it cannot be eliminated, at least it is not being eliminated because of the very complex survival strategies by virtue of its very intelligent uh, nature of the, of the genome of the bacterium. And the TB being airborne, if I am traveling and today India is perhaps last year we registered 7% growth. It's one of the fastest growing economy. Despite the recent uh, uh, crash last week with the Chinese market, it didn't seem to have much impact in India other than our rupee losing out to the dollar. It has now touched to 67 rupees a dollar as opposed to 64 rupees. So we lost uh, sub significantly. But economy has not. And because of that, Travel by air is becoming very common, it's very competitive now. In fact, if you travel by train, the Indian railways have agreed to, to have arrived at an agreement with the low cost airlines. If you do not get confirmation within 24 hours, the railways will give you the option to travel by air by paying small amount of maybe 10% of what you have paid already. Imagine, because, and what they do, their occupancy in the air is not 100%. So they are signing with them. And this is what I call it as a disruptive innovation. There is a fact that air travel, people are traveling, but occupancy is not 100%. There is a fact that people are wanting to travel by train. Everybody cannot be accommodated. So why don't we team the, put the two together? And that's what is happening now today. And because of that, herd immunity and, and this kind of immunocompromised population traveling becomes a source of, of spreading the bacterium. Poor diagnosis, as I said, there is no real diagnosis, drug abuse, no new drugs, and absence of poor returns of, on investment. Unlike diseases such as high blood pressure or cancer or, or diabetes, where I will be taking the drug for the rest of my life. Here I'll take it only for six months, eight months, that's it. Or if I'm unlucky, maybe two years. So my, my, for a company, if I make the drug, Unless there are more cases, there will not be enough return on my investment. Whereas if I am making palliatives for drugs which are for diseases which are, which are metabolic errors or, meta or, or going to be there for life, I will continue to buy that medicine whether it is an insulin sensitizer or whether it is a beta blockers or whether it is a, a, a cardiac uh, uh, statins. All those will be required but here return would be very less. So that's another reason. So we need to have, uh, have, uh, have enough structure and we need to have the state to compensate and to assure a captive clientele for these drugs. That's again a political commitment is required. There is no effective vaccine and poor awareness, still a social taboo because it affects people in the early and in the, in the early uh, economically uh, uh, active stage of your life. So you start earning a living, you stop earning a living. And as a consequence, you, you start feeling, everybody feels that, oh, he's doing, he's, not, he's doing nothing, he has TB, so he can't do anything. So he gets a kind of psychological pressure. So he doesn't want, if another person in that community has TB, they know that I'll be under a social taboo. So I will not like to disclose that I'm having TB. So I'll silently go to a quack and who will diagnose me and give me some drug and I'll get treated for one month and I'll find that my appetite has come back. I'm no longer feeling weak and I'll stop taking the drug. And that's why... I'll now give, I'll now be the source for multi-drug resistant TB. So that's again a major problem. And of course, not enough funding for TB research. Let me conclude by thanking a large number of students, graduate students and postdocs. I have a good number of postdocs in my laboratory in IIT Delhi. We have a 
20 strong group and uh, a large number of people who were initially at uh, the Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics. And lately, I have been associated with Dr. Reddy's Institute of Life Sciences. I am also an uh, honorary and distinguished professor. My grants are both at, at IIT Delhi and also at Dr. Reddy's because this is a private institution. So the regimes for, for, for uh, uh, let's say, using the grants are less stringent as compared to a government institution like IIT. And I've also been fortunate to be a fellow of the Robert Koch Institute, RKI. And I earlier was, uh, I never had a, vaca a vacation in my life till I moved to IIT Delhi because now I'm a professor. As a professor, I get two months of paid vacation. In my all my career, I never used my vacation at all. I, I supposed to be one month paid vacation, but in your life as a director or the vice chancellor, there's no time for you to take a vacation. But now I take vacation. I go and spend time at the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin, and they have been very generous to me. I also have been generously supported by a Center of Excellence grant in the phase one, and now a phase two, again, more than a million dollar grant for the next five years. And I'm also hoping to get, uh, uh, which is not shown here, uh, our, our Mark Darshi Fellowship, which is a senior investigator award by the, by the Wellcome Trust. They've called me for an interview in November, so they've gone through three tiers of selections. And that will give me enough cushion to do things my own, of my things, which are not part of the mandate. It's essential to do high risk research, because if you make a commitment, you have to do something about it. And in India, there's a lot of focus on translational research, which means you're looking at low hanging fruits. I want to look at n fruits which are not even there so that we can generate something which could be useful tomorrow, which is a very high risk. And that's where these kind of uh, cushion that I get is, uh, will allow me. Thank you so much for your time. If you need any questions, you can go to my website or go to my write to me. And I, I normally respond to every single email. Thank you for your time.